well, not as much. We were scheduled to go to Hawaii in April this year, but our traveling All partner, right. Dr. Adams, died, so oh. we won't be going this year. All right, well, I guess I got the thumbs up to get started, so without further ado, my Hey, Gail, how are you? Good. Pull that door shut. So. All right, well, everybody welcome to the uh, rots and spots portion of uh, Master Gardener training this year. A few of you look fairly familiar. I think you were here last year and heard me kind of stumble my way through the, the first year of trying to do it, so hopefully I do better this year. Get started. Um, yeah, Mike is... Terry had mentioned I, there will be some uh, time for questions a little bit later. So if you could please just hold off until we, until we get to those times. So first, Will? Yeah, I d yep. Over I just moved over to Okay. 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 What did you talk about last week? I missed it. Um, uh, SNAP programs, food programs that are around the, the state of Nebraska. That'll work. Nationwide, um, and how it can affect master gardeners. And All right. So now, without further ado, we will we'll get started. So first, a um, little bit about what plant diseases are. If you hear a pathologist talk about a plant disease, it can be a little bit different than hearing a horticulturalist talk about a plant disease. But for my purposes, a disease is really anything that prevents a plant from reaching its maximum potential. So if you're looking at corn, your yield is going to be its maximum potential. But that's different for landscapes. You know, if you have a have those uh, that nice rose bush, well, now you're looking for those nice, beautiful flowers on it. Or if it's a tree, you want that good, luscious growth with some nice shade. So really, we call disease anything that prevents the plant from its reaching its maximum potential. So there are a few different components of the, the disease pathosystem, as we refer to it. Uh, we have the environment, a susceptible host and a virulent pathogen. And the amount of disease development is really dependent on how much these three elements of our disease pathosystem overlap. And so when we have a situation like right like we have here where there's not really no overlap between the environment, susceptible host and virulent pathogen, in these situations, we tend to see very light, but more, more often than not, no disease occur. Thanks, Kelly. Compare that to this situation where now we're starting to, starting to get a fair amount of overlap of these three elements of the pathosystem. Now we're going to see a lot more disease occur. And Hopefully, you guys will not be in a situation where you're seeing something like this, where we have almost complete overlap of the three components of our disease pathosystem. When a situation like that occurs, you're going to have pretty severe disease. And um, if there is anything to do, you know, um, the chemical options can help control these. But often when we have this sort of situation, you may just need to move the plant or just kind of cut your losses and hope that next year goes better, unfortunately. So, again, like I had mentioned, the amount of disease development really is dependent on how much these systems all overlap. And that's how, that's how much disease we'll get. But the overall impact of that disease on the host 
that's very dependent on when this um, when this overlap occurs in the plant or in the plant's um, lifespan. If it occurs early in the season, so say shortly after you've planted something, you have these seedlings come up, perfect storm where you have um, a lot of overlaps. Maybe you have some damping off in the soil, um, along with a ver uh, along with a favorable environment for that disease. Well, those plants are probably, those seedlings are probably just going to die before they've ever had a chance to, to do anything for you. Compare that to if it's maybe later in the season, of, if you're starting to see a little bit of rust develop on your turf at the end of the year, well, the turf's about to go dormant. It's already kind of going, ending its uh, seasonal life cycle. You're not going to have that much of an impact, overall impact on the host. So again, the later um, that we have the the later that this disease occurs on the host, generally for the better. And really, with as far as disease disease development goes, um, with ornamental plant diseases, management is a very significant factor that can influence disease management. Really, because it influences all portions of that pathosystem, both the environment, the host, and the pathogen. So first we'll just kind of break it down into the two main types of diseases that we path or uh, pathologists tend to think about. First are the abiotic diseases. These are caused by our non-living hosts. Um, sun scorch, nutrient deficiencies, if you have a drought issue, that would be an example of an abiotic disease. Compare that to our biotic diseases. So biotic diseases are our living diseases. Um, those are caused by a living agent, um, typically fungi, bacteria, or nematodes. However, we can consider a biotic disease to be anything that's um, caused by a living, a living organism. Earlier I had a question about deer feeding on, on grass. That could that could be considered a biotic disease. So whenever we're looking at disease, it's always good to, to look at our symptom distribution at three levels. So we like, really like to start out broad and then focus things down. So first, always look at the whole, uh, the whole landscape, um, then individual plants, and once you see where on the individual plants the disease is occurring, then we even recommend you look into the, on the plant parts. Where on these plant parts are we seeing disease? So if you're at, looking at the landscape and you're starting to see disease or starting to see injury show up, where that's showing up can tell, a, can tell pathologists quite a bit about what might be going on. So if we have a situation like we have on this top picture where we have a lot of injury that's occurring right on the border. Um, generally, that's going to be a sign of some sort of environmental issue. As you can see, we have injury all along those last, um, basically the outside plants all the way around. The environment right on those outside plants is going to be different than the ones on the inside. They're drying out a lot more quickly. Maybe they're, they are a little bit more drought stressed. But that's what we tend to see for something that may be environmental. Um, compare that to this picture um, here on the bottom, where maybe you have one, one corner of the landscape, you're starting to, see, starting to see some disease come in, but it's slowly moving in from an area. This is pretty typical of an insect issue, as we're seeing the insects move through, move through the landscape. This is also what we tend to expect if there is a sort of, um, if there's a virus issue, as a lot of viruses are vectored by insects. So as the insect moves through the landscape, they're able to move that virus through there as well. Other things that we would look for are something like this picture right down here. And these are lawnmower tracks on a lawn, but sometimes there can be uh, uh, stresses or if there are extra stresses on a plant, they can become more susceptible to a lot of diseases. In this case, if you continue to mow in the same pattern time after time, you may have a little bit of soil compaction that's occurring right where those wheel tracks are going. And that could be what's causing the, um, the turf within the wheel tracks to, to be injured. Compare that to something like we have up here 
where you're starting to just kind of see some random areas that are injured throughout the, um, throughout the landscape. Over time, these areas are starting to progress, but they're not progressing very uniformly. They're not a perfect circle. They're not just only going in one direction, just kind of moving, moving slowly out. That's pretty much what we tend to expect for your typical um, fungal disease, or nematode issues can be very similar to this as well. Big thing about symptom distribution is if it is a biotic disease, so one caused by a living agent, typically those are not very uniform. Um, the, the environmental issues, those tend to be a lot more uniform across the landscape, but true disease caused by an abiotic uh, or caused by a biotic factor often will look sim similar to what we're seeing right up there. So now focusing in a little bit onto where on the plant are we seeing these, these symptoms occur? Are they on the roots? Are we seeing them on the lower leaves? Are they up on the top, or, up top part of the plant? Or this is a hops plant, or are we just seeing them on the reproductive um, portions of the plant? That can tell us a lot as well. A lot, of, a lot of pathogens are fairly selective about the parts of the plants that they will attack. And that can give us a really good idea what's, what's really going on. And then finally, focusing down even more to the individual plant parts, where on those individual plant parts are we seeing the disease? Are we seeing just some marginal burning like we have right here? Are we seeing fairly uniform spots that are occurring throughout the leaf, all about the same size, um, but not really in a very set pattern? Compare that to over here where, yeah, we have some spots on the, on the leaves, but they're all, they're all different sizes, and we really can't see any sort of pattern to those spots. We, something like this, where we have a lot, of, um, a lot of spots that are all about the same size in a fairly uniform pattern, that's a, pretty, um, that's a, good, a good idea that it's not going to be a biotic disease chances are this is something abiotic. Um, likely herbicide drift can really cause, really cause issues like this. Again, most diseases do not cause uniform injury. So now as we're looking at this leaf right here, and just across the veins, we're starting to get a little bit of chlorosis or yellowing around the veins. That can tell us something. Or if we're looking over here, where we have a whole lot of different size holes in the leaf, um, that's typical of insect injury, especially as we, as we see these, that these holes are, um, they are, they are not really able to cross the major veins. Again, the more information that we have is the easier we can make our, make our disease diagnosis. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. I thought the camera was on. All right. Um, so now we're just looking at the overall sizes of our, of our common plant pathogens. So here we have our, your typical plant cell, pretty more or, less a, more or less a box. But then inside of this cell, we have our four main types of plant pathogens. And so the smallest one that we have are the, uh, the viruses. Um, and here, all that we have for those are just the virus particles that you can kind of see in the middle. Moving up, we have the bacteria. And then after that, we tend to get into the much larger plant pathogens, the multicellular plant pathogens. And those are our fungi and our nematodes. But, you know, I really like to break things down into <laughs> two, different, two different types of diseases as well. So yeah, we have our biotic diseases, but further breaking those down, I tend to think we can even say there's two main types. There are the cons and there are the thugs. And so when you think about a con, a con man, you know, he's, a, he's someone who is, will deceive you. Goal is not to set off any alarms or any sort of security um, questions. And ideally, that con will continue to come back to you time after time, continuing to suck you dry. Compare that to a thug. Well, the thugs, you know, they're just going to break and enter, could not care less if they set off an alarm, they're gonna be out of there before, before the defenses can come. 
So the thugs, they just get what they want, and then they get out. Really, we can think about diseases as those same, those same ways. And so we have our biotrophs. Those are the diseases that feed on living tissue. Typically, those are bacteria and viruses, although there are some fungi and nematodes that do as well. But our biotrophs are typically can be thought of as cons. They're going, to use the, they're going to use the plant for what they want and hope that the plant won't ever know that they're in there. Compare that to our necrotrophs. Those are the ones that feed on dead or dying tissue. And a lot, often those are our fungi and nematodes. And so they're going to go and they'll kill the plant. They'll kill those individual cells. As soon as those cells are killed, the plant's immune, immune system goes off and starts, um, basically it just starts a, a hormonal cascade that can cause a few, different, um, a few different immune responses, but these thugs tend to not care about that. Again, they're going in, they're taking all the nutrients, and then they're out before, before the uh, plant's able to do anything. So, starting with our cons, first of all, I'll discuss the viruses. So these, again, are our smallest plant pathogens. They are too small to be seen with the light microscope, Viruses are unable to enter the plants on their own. So all, a lot of the viruses that we work with, they have to be transmitted by something, whether that's an insect such as thrips or aphids, or if it's nematodes can help transmit viruses, as can different, there are some fungi that transmit viruses. However, within the landscape, one of the things that transmits most viruses are people and pruning. And so whenever you go through, if you're doing any cutting, make sure that you're disinfecting your tools between plants. If you have a virus issue in one of those plants and then you go and cut another one, you've now just spread this virus. And getting a little bit larger are our bacteria. And these are single-celled organisms. And again, similar to, similar to viruses, most bacteria are unable to infect a plant on their own. They need some other sort of opening in order to, uh, in order to cause infection. And this, this, inf this opening can be caused by hail, uh, it could be caused by some other sort of environmental, um, some other sort of environmental factor. Or it could even be, if you are doing some pruning and it, it gets moist, there's a rain event, well, that pruning, that you've opened up a wound site, and now this is where the bacteria can enter if need be. Bacteria tend to be favored by warm and humid conditions, and they can survive in soil and also in the plant debris as well. And as we get a little bit larger, kind of done talking about the cons, and now we'll discuss a few of the thug pathogens. First is fungi. Um, and just a little bit about fungi terminology. The hyphae is the small thread-like filament that we have. And on the top picture, here we can see an individual hyphae um, that's growing along the, uh, the root of some turf. Mycelia is going to be a mass of that hyphae. So kind of that, when it, what looks like kind of cottony growth or a spider web sort of thing, that's your mycelia. And in the middle picture there, we can see the mycelia mat on the turf. Spores are um, really any of the reproductive structures that, that these fungi produce. Most fungi require uh, free moisture on the leaves in order, or on the plant in order to, to cause infection. And so a lot of times they'll need anywhere between four and 12 hours of continuous leaf wetness in order for these fungi to, to actually infect. So when it's really dry, or we have a really dry season, we tend not to see very many virus issues. And as with bacteria, uh, these fungi can survive in infected plant debris, they can survive in the soil, they can survive, just period. And getting into our bigger thug are our nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic, worm-like animals. A, uh, a non-segmented roundworm is the technical term for it, but really just a, a really small, really small worm. They can feed, primarily people think about nematodes feeding on the roots or underground portions of plants. 
That's often the case, but there are quite a few nematodes that can feed in foliar portions of plants as well. So you may see some of these issues a little bit further up the plant. Um, typically, if they are feeding on the, on the lower parts of the plants or on the root tissue, if you look at those roots closely, you, you may start to see some deformation, whether it's galls or you may just see some, some lesions or brown areas where the, uh, where the nematodes have been feeding. And another one that we have is a phytoplasma. Phytoplasmas are kind of, a, you, there's, you kind of think of them as a cross between viruses and bacteria. So they're not quite viruses, not quite bacteria, but they, have, they kind of behave like both of them do. Typically with phytoplasmas though, we, uh, the symptomology is pretty similar to a, to a viral infection. And so you'll start to see the entire plant will, have, will show symptoms as opposed to just individual portions of it. And that can be stunting, chlorosis, or just an abnormal growth habit. And as I've been talking, you may have thought that pathogen and disease I've been using interchangeably. I hope that I haven't. Um, because we like to say that a disease is the malfunctioning of the host cells and tissues that result from a continuous irritation of a pathogenic agent or environmental factor that leads to the development of symptoms. Um, compare that to a pathogen, and the pathogen is the actual entity that causes the disease. And so if a lot of you should be familiar with pine wilt disease, pine Pine wilt is the name of the disease, but it's caused by the, path, by the nematode pathogen versus Phalanchus xylophilus. And a little bit, two more terms are sign and symptoms. And so a sign will be the, visible, the actual visible evidence of that, of that pathogen. And so if it's a fungal pathogen that's actually seeing the, the mycelia growing, or if we have a, have a conch growing on a tree, like we have on that, uh, that far picture, that is the actual fungus that's growing out. That is a sign of the, of the disease. Compare that to a symptom, and a symptom is basically the change in function and appearance of the affected plant. And so here we have some, uh, we have some spruce needles that are, that are yellowing. We can't see any individual uh, fungal any fungal part portions on there, that is a symptom. So when we're not able to see the actual pathogen, it's a symptom. And now we'll discuss the, some of the abiotic diseases that you guys may, may see. Abiotic diseases can really be caused by any one of these things. So we, um, pollution, there are sm uh, smoke damage can cause issue on, on some plants. Um, water issues, if it's, too, if it's too wet, is it too dry? Like that. And again, uh, thinking about just how abiotic diseases, how, they, how their symptomology tends to look, typically abiotic diseases are more uniform across the landscape than a biotic disease. Off, and also on these abiotic diseases, we may not have very specific symptoms that are showing up. And so it's not going to be individual spots that are a certain color. It may just be a general decline that we're starting to see. And also, with these, a lot of these abiotic, abiotic diseases, if you think back to what the, what the weather's been doing prior to injury occurring, you may be able to time that to a specific weather event or environmental event. And also with these abiotic diseases, as they often become much more pronounced with additional stresses. So one that is had to deal with fairly often is just frost crack. The, the, uh, the freezing and thawing that occurs within the bark um, over the course, of the course of the winter can cause that bark to crack open. And now here we have a maple tree that has a pretty decent sized crack um, in the bark and you can see a bunch of mushrooms that are starting to grow out of, those, out of that bark. So now it's, this cracking has opened up, opened up a, a site for an infection site for this fungus to attack, and that's now what we're seeing. 
Another one that I'm sure people are fairly familiar with is root girdling. So if, you, if you've kept a, a plant in the container too long and the roots just have to grow around itself and they kind of circle, um, circle in and they'll choke themselves, that is root girdling. Unfortunately, oftentimes with, if you do have a root issue, you don't know. Um, you won't, you only see issues on the, the top portion of the plant if it's a tree. There may just be a general decline, general yellowing that you're seeing of the leaves, and it wouldn't be until you would, would actually dig that, dig that root ball up that you would see, okay, these roots really aren't spreading. They're just constricting around themselves and preventing nutrient absorption the way it should be. Another one is salt damage. Here we have this injury from salt that's been applied to the, uh, to the sidewalk. But more often than not, our salt injury will look more similar to this, where there's just going to be a little bit of burning um, on the margins of the leaves. And typically with salt injury, it's going to be the, uh, some of the lower leaves. The lower leaves are the first ones that tend to show that, show that burning. Also with um, salt damage, another sign of that would be just uh, slow or spotty germination. Or if you do have restricted root development, that can be a, um, another one. And a gr one of the th nice things about salt injury is you can often just do, um, do some excess watering and that will help leach the salts out of, this, out of the root zone. And oftentimes the plants will recover. And so if you are seeing pretty severe salt injury, recommend um, just doing three to four inches of overhead irrigation and hopefully that will leach most of the salts out of the root zone to where now the plant can, um, can grow in a healthy manner. Another one that we see is a winter injury. And so here we have winter injury on a couple of conifers. But um, again, just the top portion of the plants. And here, as if you look at this uh, the, the picture of the Christmas tree farm, most of the trees in that picture are affected by this. So it's fairly uniform across the, across the, uh, across the field. A good, symptom, a good indicator that it's an abiotic disease. Another one that you can get is lawnmower blight. So if you mow too close to the trees, you may uh, end up nicking the, nicking the bottom portion of it right at the crown. It's going to what we like to call lawnmower blight. Another one that we got quite a few calls on la the last year has been herbicide drift. Um, herbicide drift can be a, can look similar to viruses where you will have just abnormal growth that starts to occur. The other thing that you may see is, as we have in the, in the bottom left picture there, is the leaves are just kind of cupped. And that's a pretty typical sign of a growth regulator, um, growth regulator uh, herbicide. Another one that I'm guessing most of you guys have seen or will see is sun scald. So sun scald is just caused by, is the name, basically a sunburn to the, to the plant tissues. And one of the things that kind of helps diagnosing sun scald is you should, the sun scald should be most severe in the areas that get the most sunlight. So the areas that, aren't, that don't get a whole lot of sun, you're not going to see sun scald issues there. Fruit cracking is another one, and this is just as the, as the plants are nearing maturity, they may just start to crack. Blossom end rot, everybody's favorite issue with tomatoes. This one is actually caused by a calcium deficiency. And so as the, as the fruit is nearing maturity, there's not enough calcium there for the, uh, not enough, not enough calcium for the, um, for the plant to uptake, and we tend to get this rotted, uh, the rotted blossom ends of the fruit. Another thing that can, can uh, exacerbate blossom end rot is if you have very irregular uh, watering schedule. And so if, there's, if the plants are continuously going through a, a drought um, flood stress cycle, that can also increase the amount of blossom end rot that you have. Okay. No, they are not. So, okay. So we had a question um, 
of whether or not uh, Sun Scald and Frost Crack are the same thing. And no, no, they are not. Um, they, can, they can look similar on occasion, but no, we, we do not consider them to be the same thing. Um, another one that we have is cat face. Again, cat face is just a, it's a physiological, um, physiolog physiological abnormality um, that's, that can occur as the, as the plants, as the fruit is nearing maturity. Sometimes you may just look and you'll see that if you have tomatoes or peppers or something like that that you've done some pruning to, you go back out a couple of days later and you see that a lot of the leaves have just kind of rolled in on, on themselves. Just call that physiological leaf roll. And this occurs primarily when we have, when we've pruned, an, when basically we've pruned more from the plant than we should have. And so we've pruned an amount that is um, more, basically we've pruned more, uh, more shoot tissue than the roots are able to provide for. And then, then as the roots are struggling, with this, uh, with the less foliage, now we're starting to see these these leaves roll. Another one that may have seen, I tend to get this on my tomatoes every year, is just yellow shoulders disorder. Um, yellow shoulders disorder can affect the it can affect the the taste of the fruit, and so the tomatoes will not taste as good typically if you have yellow shoulders. But this tends to be caused by um, uh, by not having enough potassium in the soil. And one of the issues with yellow shoulders is um, you really need to make sure that you have the correct amount of potassium at flowering. Once the fruit has started to develop, it's almost too late to do anything to, to prevent yellow, yellow shoulders. And as far as managing a lot of these abiotic diseases, a lot of these management techniques just focus on reducing overall plant stress. So one of the first things we can do is just to have a good fertilizer program. Um, not, not, not applying too much fertilizer, not applying too little, but based off of environment and the plant, applying the correct amount. Also, if you do any staking, um, Proper staking can really reduce the exposure to excessive sunlight. And so you may not tend to get those issues with sun scald if you do uh, proper staking. If you're able to control any uh, biotic diseases, that tends to decrease our abiotic diseases. And so a lot of our foliar diseases will lead to a loss of leaves. Those leaves, as we lose those leaves, the plants have lost some of their photosynthetic potential. So if we're able to control these, those, uh, those foliar diseases, that can increase the overall health of the plant as well. Let's cover the soil. So mulching really helps, um, helps the plants maintain and, uh, proper moisture levels. And again, this kind of is, ties into proper water management. You want to make sure that we're not overwatering or underwatering our plants. And you know, one thing that we like to think is that most or a lot of plants that we have, they, they don't really like wet feet. It's one way that I like to think of them. So especially if we have any potted plants or container grown plants, you want to make sure that those plants aren't sitting and that the bottom of those plant or pots isn't just going to be a soupy mess. So you can put a few pieces of wood at the bottom of the pot and that will, will really help some of the water to drain out, especially if there are holes in the bottom of the pot. Really, as far as managing a lot of these abiotic diseases, we just will try to think of anything that we can do that will reduce overall stress to the plants. And I guess any questions about the abiotic diseases that I've discussed or just general pathology? So that was a, um, a question about, about cat face and, and what causes that. Again, I'm not, not entirely sure. I think that it's a, it's a nutrient. It's a nutrient issue that causes cat face as well. Um, but 
yeah, as, as, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not, not the most familiar with that one, unfortunately. So it, one of the questions was, in potted plants, where does the excess salt come from? Well, it can come, it can come from a few places. Um, if you have, if you've been applying fertilizer to those, to those potted plants, a lot of those fertilizers are, um, contain salt or are made of salt and that can in increase the overall salt content. Or if you just have, if you have hard water and if you do a lot of kind of very light watering of the, of the potted plant, you're not going to get, the water is not going to get all the way to the bottom of that pot. And so a lot of the moisture, including the salts, will remain right up towards the top. And so really those salts can come just from your, from your groundwater. How does, how does fruit cracking happen was another question. Uh, fruit cracking tends to happen basically when the, when, the, uh, when the fruit matures too quickly. And so again, that's going to, um, going to be just a function of, of the moisture levels and nutrient levels. Um, you know, it's wood works, you can, or you can use stones, but that tends to make things a little bit heavier. Um, but yeah, I think that, think that wood works, works just fine. Can, so another question is, can physiological leaf roll be caused by anything aside from, um, aside from pruning issues? We can see physiological leaf roll um, when there's been a herbicide issue. And so if there's been some herbicide drift that's, that's hit the plants, their, their leaves may start to curl as well. Uh, and yes, and, and insect feeding can also, can also cause that. What is proper staking? Um, if you are doing tomatoes or some of these other, um, some other vegetables that it can get pretty large and they, they may flop over. This is proper staking is making sure that the, that the stem will be, that there's something for the stem to grow up and so there's some sort of stem support for it. Uh, leaves rolling. Tomatoes with leaves rolling on the top that have purple veins could be a few things. Um, that could be an insect issue. That could also be herbicide drift would be another issue. Or it, that, could be a, uh, that could be a sign of a virus issue in tomatoes. <laughs> Welcome to the world of disease. Is, next question was, is soft water a problem with salt damage? And the answer to that is, I am not sure. Um, I, I do not know, I apologize. Right. We did have one more question in here. So a uh, question about disinfecting tools um, to prevent the spread of viruses. 10% um, bleach works really well to disinfect a lot of tools, but I'll, I'll cover that a little bit later as well. So, all right. So with that, we will move into some of our biotic diseases. So with these biotic diseases, first I'm just going to talk about some of these very general diseases that a lot of plants tend to get. And if we start from the bottom, crown, root, and stem rots um, can affect it, pretty much every plant that's out there, um, they, can, they can have some sort of rot that occurs either in the roots, right at the crown, or lower, lower stem that end moves up. And as you can see in these pictures, we have some healthy leaves, or uh, this top picture, we have some healthy roots right next to some very rotted roots. And then if you look at the split tomato plants, you can see that the second tomato plant in there where it's been split, uh, the inside of the vascular tissue is just brown or discolored, a sure sign that there's a crown or stem rot going on. 
And these are our biotic diseases. So uh, crown and stem rots, again, most plants are susceptible to them. And they can be caused by quite a few different types of soil microbes. So there are some oomycetes, uh, the water molds as we tend to think of them. Uh, those are Pythium and Phytophthora are the main oomycetes that will cause damping off or these route or crown and root rots. Some of the uh, primary fungi that cause these diseases are, will be Fusarium or Rhizoctonia. We can also have bacteria that cause these crown root and stem rots as well. And a lot of those bacteria will be in the genus Erwinia or Pseudomonas. And so just some general symptoms when we do have some sort of crown rot or crown or stem rot is a discoloration, discoloration of the plant. And as we go, as we look further up the plant towards the top portions, we may just see some general wilting or the plants just look a little bit flaccid. They, they don't look healthy. But there's not actually an issue on the, that's going on on the top part of the plants. That wilting or flaccid look is all due to the plant not being able to uptake nutrients the way that it should. Also, if you see any sort of dark brown or black kind of water-soaked lesions that are right around the soil line and extend up, or if they're on the roots, again, that's a sure sign of crown or root rot. And another thing that I like to do is anytime a sample comes into the clinic, I like to smell it. Um, Surprisingly enough, different diseases do smell a little bit differently. And so if I have a plant that is infected with Pythium and it's been in, it's been in an enclosed Ziploc bag overnight, if I open that bag and stick my nose in there, it's going to have a bit of a fishy odor to it. And so if you notice a bit of a fishy odor, you may have Pythium. Again, that's general rule of thumb, not always the case. Or if you're smelling it and it's just kind of smells sickly sweet, often that's going to be a soft rot or one of your bacterial issues. So uh, the back Erwinia or Pseudomonas. As far as management of these diseases, first and foremost, plant resistant varieties if you can. Um, a lot of the varieties that we have out there, um, they, will, they will be more or less susceptible to the different, different crown and stem rots. Also crop rotation or plant rotation plays a, a really big role in managing some of these, some of these rots of the lower, lower plant. If you're planting tomatoes in the same area year after year, eventually you're going to have some issues occur. So we like to recommend doing about a three to five year rotation for your garden or your, your landscape, the annuals in your landscape just so you're not building up um, a, certain, a certain pathogen in an area. Also, a lot of these pathogens, um, they need free moisture or an excess amount of moisture in order to, to infect. So anything that you can do that would improve drainage tends to affect our crown and root rots. As with most, of the, most diseases, try to remove infected material as soon as you see it. And with these, you want to make sure to remove the entire plant, including the root, uh, including the root ball for it. Chemical treatments of crown, uh, crown and root rots, we typically don't recommend, primarily because they, get, they can be a fairly expensive and they often require repeat applications. Another thing with a lot of these crown and root rots is you, if it's a, say you have a rhubarb, um, stand of rhubarb or something like that that you have a soft rot in, you may think, well, I'll just go and transplant that to another area where we don't have this bacteria. Unfortunately, anytime you transplant something, you're going to be moving some of that soil along with it, and that soil can then harbor, can harbor some of those crown rot um, pathogens as well. Next is powdery mildew. Uh, powdery mildew tends to just be a superficial white or kind of gray growth over the surface of leaves, stems, fruits, and flowers. Typically, um, powdery mildew is caused by a very host-specific fungi. So the powdery mildew that affects your lilacs should not, affect your, um, should not affect your turf or any of your peonies, anything like that. And powdery mildew is it's a very environmentally dependent pathogen. 
So it needs moderate temperatures, um, but also it needs high humidity and poor air circulation. High humidity and poor air circulation typically go hand in hand. And so if you're able to do anything that can improve, um, improve air circulation or decrease humidity in an area, hopefully that will decrease the amount of powdery mildew that you have. Here we have a powdery mildew of roses, and you can see just the superficial growth, uh, white growth on the leaves, but also on some of the, uh, some of the flowers. Um, and, you know, powdery mildew of roses, uh, this one likes rain, a little, likes rainfall and temperatures in the 70s to 80s. Again, typical of most of our powdery mildews. Also, if we have low daytime humidity followed by high nighttime humidity, that can really increase the amount of powdery mildew that we have as well. So as, as, we, as, the, get, as the temperatures drop at night and the humidity increases, again, that's a perfect storm for powdery mildew. And even though it is just a lot of superficial, of superficial growth, those plants are not able to photosynthesize as well as they would be able to without that growth on there. And that just depletes their overall nutrients. And here we just have another picture of powdery mildew on, on some roses. This is uh, powdery mildew on Kentucky bluegrass, completely different fungus than the, than the powdery mildew of, of roses, but the same sort of things apply. In, um, increased humidity, decreased airflow is when we tend to see powdery mildew on turf. And if, some, if one were to bring a sample of powdery mildew into the uh, plant and pest diagnostic clinic and we look at it underneath the scope, the white cottony growth that we see is actually just these chains of, of, gee, these chains of fungal spores that are growing. And this is what the spores look like underneath a, a scope. So as far as controlling powdery mildew, again, if you have a resistant variety available, recommend doing that resistant variety. Also, sanitation is very important. Make sure to remove or rake up any infected leaves. If you can improve air circulation, that's great. If you can um, increase sun exposure, that's gonna be great as well. Another thing that you can do is uh, thin your plants. And so if you have a really heavy stand, if you have a lot of peonies in the area, maybe go ahead and, and thin out every third or fourth peony to increase airflow through there, and that may decrease the amount of powdery mildew that you have. And in cases that, um, in severe cases, there are some protective fungicide sprays that are effective. Um, uh, Bordeaux's mixture, uh, some, some of these copper-based products effectively control powdery mildew as well. One of the next common diseases that we get is anthracnose. And so for every plant that's out there, there is a type of anthracnose that can affect it. Similar to powdery mildew, most of the anthracnose um, diseases are caused by a very host-specific fungi. So the anthracnose of your, of your pepper will not be the same anthracnose on turf. Anthracnose, in addition to affecting the, the leaves or the fruit, we may also just see it on the stems. And so there will just be these black, black lesions that form on the stems, um, a sure sign of anthracnose. And as far as managing for it, now if you can plant uh, disease-free plants is, is a good one. So if you are doing transplants, you'll want to make sure that there is not some, an, not some anthracnose on there already. Okay. Depend so question is can you can you safely compost um, plants that are infected with powdery mildew? The answer is it depends. Um, if you are one of the 0.001% of home composters that do proper composting, you'll probably be okay. I am yet to see a home compost pile that's been done properly, though. Um, and if you're, so if you're not reaching those temperatures, then you're not able to properly do it. And I do have a little bit more on, on composting and dis, uh, disposal of disease tissue later on. So we'll discuss that. So 
Again, um, so moving back to management of anthracnose on some of our fruits. You know, one thing is not to let that fruit over ripen. Um, as the fruit over ripens, now you're just waiting. It's no longer um, able to fend off a lot of the a lot of the fungal pathogens, and the anthracnose can really take up take over. Minimize your overhead irrigation. A lot of a lot of the anthracnose fungi are they survive in the soil. Overhead irrigation tends to help that soil splash up, and then those spores can now infect the, uh, the, infect the higher leaves. Similar to that, you'll want to water early in the day. If you water early in the day, you now have all day to let the sun, um, uh, to let the sun kind of bake off a lot of, the, a lot of the moisture that's going to be on the leaves. Without that, um, that period of leaf wetness, you're not going to have near as much infection. Mulching with straw instead of plastic tends to really increase um, man, or tends to really decrease the amount of anthracnose. And again, um, if you see some infected plant parts, go ahead and remove them. So if you have a few leaves that are infected or some fruits that are infected, remove those as soon as you see it. De that will just decrease the amount of anthracnose spores that will be available. So I've been talking about anthracnose on some gardens plants, but we also get anthracnose on pretty much every other plant. We tend to see, got a lot of calls with anthracnose on some trees last year. It can infect sycamores, ashes, oaks, maples, walnuts, poplars. Like I said, most plants, there is a type of anthracnose that can infect them. And with trees, we tend to see a worse anthracnose in years where we have an extended bud break period. And so if you think about the weather last season, it was pretty, or at least in Lincoln, it was pretty cool in the early spring, and then it just stayed cool for quite a few weeks. That, and that's right as a lot of the trees were starting to, um, as the buds were starting to break, that increased moisture and cooler temperatures during that bud break period really increased the amount of anthracnose that was able to infect the trees. And um, typically, with anthracnose, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the lesions will be along the veins. And so as you see um, the top picture of the maple leaf that we have there, you see that a lot of the lesions do tend to originate at the veins and spread out. Pretty typical of, of anthracnose. And if it's, you have it year and year, if you have it year after year, eventually it can cause the shoots or twigs to die. Um, but the fungi overwinter on infected twigs and small branches for trees, typically if you have a, a mature tree, it's going to be pretty difficult for any of those, uh, those soil fungi to get up into the tree. And the symptoms tend to appear following a cool, wet weather in spring. But it's talked about anthracnose on vegetables, on trees, turf will get anthracnose as well. Um, pretty much every, uh, every turf species that we have can get anthracnose. And so again, you may, you may tend to see it on turf. But just general control of anthracnose. Again, plant resistant varieties if you're able to. Um, remove any, any infected tissue. So rake up and destroy that infected tissue. Or if that if you have to prune out the infected tissue, go ahead and do that. Um, during periods that are excessively dry, make sure that you're watering adequately and providing some mulch. And anthracnose is one of those fungi that really tends to take off on plants that are, have additional stresses. And so if they're already drought stressed or moisture stressed, they're going to be much more susceptible to anthracnose. And if you if you need to. Um, Protective fungicide sprays are are possible. So if you have some, if you have working it with uh, trees, up, up, applying a fungicide um, kind of right during that bud break period, that can provide some pretty good control of it. Unfortunately, with trees though, we typically don't see anthracnose until the buds until the leaves have fully expanded. Once the leaves are out, you can spray gallons of that fungicide on there, and it's not going to do anything. All right, so I guess are there any more questions about what I've discussed the 
these kind of common diseases that affect all sorts of plants. Yes. Yeah, um, so there, yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good question. So the question that we got was, if you have an infected plant, or is any of the safe, go, is any of the fruit going to be safe to eat? And the answer is it really depends on, it depends on the pathogen, or it depends on what's, what's going on. Um, if you have, have some virus issues in tomatoes, typically those, vi those tomatoes are still going to taste fine. Um, the, the tomatoes may be a little bit deformed, they may have some rings on them, but taste-wise, they'll, they'll be okay and they won't harm you at all. Um, so typically, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the plant pathogens that we have cannot cause, they cannot infect humans or, or animals or anything like that. However, there are, some, there are some fungal diseases that will produce some mycotoxins so a lot of fungi are really good at producing secondary, compo uh, secondary compounds, compounds that um, may be antimicrobial or have, have some other effects to them. Fusarium is one of those really common, really common soil-borne fungi, and that one is known to produce mycotoxins. Now, just because you have fusarium that's affected your, your, uh, your tomato stand, does that mean they're not safe to eat? You know, generally, I would say if the if you the fruit looks okay, you're you're probably going to be okay to eat it. Okay. So one of the questions is: if you have a history of a disease, should you automatically spray in the spring? My answer for that is: it depends. And so it's, a lot will depend on what, what is the disease. Um, and also how long, how long have you been dealing with it? The other thing that you'll want to think about is what is the environment doing? Um, are, we, are we projected to have a very wet year or a really dry year? If it's going to be a wet year, then maybe you'll want to, uh, you'll want to go ahead and do some of, those, some of those protective fungicide sprays. Otherwise, if the, if the forecast is for a fairly dry year, you might be able to get away without doing the, one of those fungicide sprays. But typically, if it's a, if it's a high, value, high value plant, um, whether economically high value, um, emotionally high value, you'll want, to, you'll want to do something to save it, and then you may want to look at a, a preventative fungicide spray. So green beans have white on them later in the season. Is it powdery mildew? Very possibly. Um, it's the, a lot will depend on, on kind of what the, what the environmental conditions that the green beans are grown in is like. If it's, again, if the beans are, if it's an area that's going to be, have a lot of humidity, not a whole lot of sunlight, um, not a whole lot of airflow, then I would say, yeah, there's a pretty good chance that, that it is green bean, or that it's powdery and mildew. The other thing is it could be um, a few, there are a few other fungal pathogens that can affect green beans that hit them later in the season. Um, white mold is one of them, and that will show up as kind of white cottony growth on the, on the plants as well. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Scott's Bluff. Did my job. <laughs> The question was about preventative measures for trees that, that have frost crack. And I would just say anything that you can do that would increase overall, overall health of that tree. And so if there's not, good, not a good mulch layer around the tree, um, go ahead and apply some mulch there. That would be, that would be a good one. Another good uh, preventative measure for that would be making sure that in the fall, before the trees are going dormant, that you're making sure that these trees are getting a good fall watering. Um, 
before they go dormant. That can, that can, really, um, can really increase the overall viability of the trees throughout the winter. Anything else? Oh, oh, and I guess tree wrap um, would work as well um, for for frost trap. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll take a ten-minute break, fifteen-minute break, and come back, and we'll look at a little bit of mushroom identification. All right. <laughs> All right. So I think that Terry has uh, opened up Slido. And so there should be a Slido question for you guys to answer. And the, what was the code, Terry? 50. So, okay. So yeah, if you're not, not signed in to slide out just the code 5020 should, should get you in. Oh, uh, we can do them both now. All right, so had a couple of Slido questions that I think a fair amount of people answered. Um, just real quickly to, to go over those questions. So the, the first question was, if the environment, um, if environmental conditions favor a certain pathogen, that pathogen will be able to attack every plant in the area regardless of the species. True or false? False. All right. Good. And then the, uh, the next question was, while pruning and removing disease, while, while pruning and removal of diseased tissue is important, it's never as effective as applying a fungicide. True or false? False. Good. Good. That was kind of trying to trick people with that. Um, a lot of people, especially will tend to think as soon as they see, see some spots show up, need to start spraying. And often there are quite a few cultural controls that can be done instead. So glad you guys got that. Um, next, we're going to do some mushroom identification. 
And so I hope that everyone had picked up a, a uh, mushroom ID in front. Anyone not? Anyone in, in Lincoln at least not have one? If you're in Scott's Bluff, I probably can't get it out to you in time. But all right, looks like looks like everyone has those. And on the uh, the back page of it, I have two different two different types of mushrooms up there. And would just like to to kind of go through um, and look at those mushrooms to see using a very generic mushroom key. Are we able to identify what we're actually seeing growing? Um, get a lot of comment or we get a lot of questions in the diagnostic clinic that are what is this mushroom that's growing in my yard and a lot great thing is a lot of mushrooms you can use it use a uh, um, a dichotomous key to to really um, help identify them up on the screen I do have a few a few of the terms that people may not be may not be familiar with and so if as we're going through the going through the mushroom uh, key, you can always refer back to refer back to that slide in your handouts to um, to get the definition. But first, we're just looking at we'll look at unknown mushroom number one. So un unknown mushroom number one was found in clumps where an oak tree had been removed two years ago. So. Um, the caps were pretty firm and about three to four inches in diameter. The stems, though, while, this, while the caps were firm, the stems were pretty flimsy. And when I was breaking the stems, I wasn't really seeing any, any liquid come out. So name that mushroom. Um, and we can, can work, through the, work through the key that hopefully you guys have. So, you know, first as we look at it, so is there, is there a vulva? And again, the vulva is kind of right at the base. If, if there's that ring around it or that cup, that is the vulva. So on mushroom number one, are we seeing a ring around it? Not, not really. Um, the, typically, if, if there was one, it would be, it's much more defined. Um, typically, you, there's not going to be a question of whether or not you do have that. You do have that. So, so that would be, the answer would be no. So as we go down our key, so now we have a stem with, with the ring. Um, is it growing? So first, does these, do these stems have rings on them for mushroom number one? Nope, all right, so we can move on to, to mushroom number three, exudes milk when damaged. Nope, nope. like I said, it has a, uh, it was pretty, no liquid came out when I broke it. Next is the, uh, is the cap, um, is the cap and stem brittle or crumbly for this one? Nope, correct, not, not brittle, so again, moving on. Um, is it growing on the remains of other mushrooms? And so if, if it was growing on the remains of other mushrooms, we'd be able to see dead mushrooms on the bottom of, on the bottom of these. So is it growing on disease or on decay, decaying mushrooms? No. Correct, good. I know this uh, down in the, in the corner um, of mushroom number one, it does look, there are some other mushrooms that are growing out there, but that's just more of a clump of mushrooms that's growing. So next, since it's not growing on mushroom domain, uh, mushroom remains, are the caps small? So less than about an inch and a half in diameter or large? Large, yep. And as we can then move on to looking at the gills, and here I will go back to, go back to this picture. So are the gills decurrent? And that just means do the gills attach as they go down the stalk? If you look on the, uh, the figure to the right on the top, towards the middle, that's the decurrent one. Are they decurrent? 
So basically, it's ours. Are the if you see the see the picture that we have here, um, the gills just slow. They they grow, will continue to grow down the to grow down the stem. So no, we we don't have decurrent gills. Is there a taproot that we're able to see? Nope. Yep. Most of these these do not have do not have a, a, a defined taproot. So we keep moving on. Are the stems uh, basically are the stems tough? Again. Nope. Good. Oh, uh, so. The, are the gills, as you look at the gills of mushroom number one, do they look thick to you or do they look fairly thin? Thin? All right, good. Then final question is, are, the mush, are they um, growing in clumps? So do we have the stem, stems that are fused at the base for multiple mushrooms or are they growing singular? Fused, yep. So I had given you guys that answer already. Um, but yeah, so unknown mushroom number one, hopefully everyone out state was able to follow through as well and got Armillaria tibescens for mushroom number one. But now we're gonna do the same one with mushroom number two. And this is one that you guys may be more likely to see actually. So we'll just go again through the, uh, through the process. So is there, a, is there a vulva on mushroom number one? Do we have that, that kind of hoop-like remains at the base of the stem for mushroom number one? No? Correct. All right. Is, are there rings on the stem? No. Um, did it exude milk when damaged? Nope. Oh, I did not, I did not read my... Um, unknown mushroom number two, apologies. So this one was found in a circular patch on the lawn. Caps were pretty firm, about an inch in diameter. Um, no liquid was observed on broken stems, but the stems were very tough and it was kind of difficult to get them to break to even pull out. So we had asked about it, does it exude milk? And the answer for that was no. So now the caps, um, Brittle or firm? Yep, firm. Growing on the remains of other mushrooms? No, nope, it's just the, it's coming up the stalks there. Um, the caps are, are they large or small? Yep, small caps. So again, we keep going down. And now we can look for, again, are the, are the gills decurrent? So are the gills growing down the stalk? Nope. Next, um, is there a is there a tap root? Um, yeah, it's not a not a very good tap root. Um, so is the uh, space there is not. The taproot would be a lot longer for these if there actually was, as opposed to maybe just having a little bit of soil that's there on the, on the edge. Um, is the, the stem, is, does the stem contain cartilage? Is, was the stem tough? Yep, it was pretty tough. So now we can kind of stop at Colia B. So fortunately it was, kind of difficult to come up with a pathology hands-on thing that can be done online. Um, a, lot of, a lot of pathology is just a matter of looking through microscopes, looking at things in person. So one of the great things is that with these dichot with these with keys like this, um, you really can identify quite a few different mushrooms. Um, same same as you would use a key like this to identify a random plant that might be growing in your, in your yard. But real quickly then, our, um, our answers. And do I? Yep, so I kind of tricked people 
as I was going through this, this last one. So if we go back, so as we look at mushroom number two, that's, the, that's a fairy ring mushroom. Uh, Merasmus, Merasmius is the, the um, genus name. But I had asked, was it growing on, growing on mushroom remains? The answer was no. Um, were the caps large or small? The answer was small. And then I just kept going on to, on to the next question as opposed to looking at, um, looking under number six to see, okay, with, with those small caps, what, what are we looking at? And the question then, underneath, once we have those small caps, are the gills, are the gills decurrent on it? So are the gills growing down the stem? The answer for that was no. Are the caps um, conical? Are basically just look like a, a cone? Not, not really, no, they're, they're fairly flat. Um, but then with the, the tough stems, that are um, that contain some cartilage that are tough. That is how we were able to to identify um, the fairy ring mushroom. So whenever you're using a key like this, it's always important to to go through it step by step. And just because you've answered one of the questions, always make sure to go and answer the rest of the questions underneath that, as opposed to as opposed to jumping on into the next one. Um, any questions about Mushroom ID, anything like that? Um, is there, you said there's mushroom values in the uh, I can send one out, but this is a fairly generalized guide. Um, you can do a, a quick Google search. Um, we'll easily come up with a, a, very similar, a very similar guide that will probably be more in depth as well. And also, if you look at the top of this mushroom ID key, again, this is only for mushrooms that have gills, a central stem, and kind of light colored spores. And so if you have a mushroom that's growing out of a tree, this key would not be of any use for it. And so that's, whenever you are doing mushroom ID, you'll see different keys for different sorts of mushrooms. And so they will, there will be, yeah, the mushrooms with gills, a central stem, and light-colored spores. Otherwise, you might have um, mushrooms with no stem. Um, that, that'll be a whole nother type of key as well. Correct. Yep. So that was my, that was my being tricky. So one of the questions was, there's uh, someone had heard that mushrooms growing on wood are safe to eat. Mushrooms growing on the ground are not safe to eat. No. Um, never eat a mushroom you see in the wild unless you know 100% what it is. Not just that you've gone through a 10-step a key and it looks like what you think it should look like, still don't eat that mushroom. You know, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of mimics that are out there for every, so morel mushrooms, everybody knows morel mushrooms, but there is a false morel mushroom. Only difference is really that if you look at the very top of it, there's a small opening at the very top of the cap. That's one of the only ways to tell the false morel from the actual morels. Um, but yeah, Growing, there are poisonous mushrooms that grow on the ground, poisonous ones that grow soy or grow on wood, same as there are poisonous mushrooms that, uh, yeah, basically, yeah. Um, yes, they they kind of are thick. Um, they're at least they're thicker than thicker than we would see on the um, on the other one. Any other questions about using a key or if not, we'll move on.
All right. Yeah, that was the right button. So now we'll um, some more general general diseases that we see. So brown rot of stone fruits, fairly common on a uh, you know peaches, other stone fruits, plums, things like that. And really, they'll just tend to look like this grayish to brown colored tufts that are actually growing out of it. And those tufts, those are the actual fungi. And so if you guys think back to, to signs versus symptoms, you think that it's a sign or a symptom if we're seeing the actual fungi. OK, so sign was the, the uh, overwhelming answer in Lincoln. And that is correct. We're actually able to see the, see the causal agent. So it's a sign of the pathogen. And here is a much more, uh, a, one that, a disease, plum that's been much, uh, much further along. And it's, the other thing about this brown rot is it can just cause these kind of mummified, mummified fruit that we get. These, yeah, delicious. I would love to eat those. Or I would not eat that, actually. But. Um, one of the things about these mum this mummified fruit is there's a, those are full of the fungal spores then. And so if you think about how many, um, all the fungus that's, the fungi that's growing out of that fruit, hundreds if not thousands or even millions of spores are being produced on that. So one of the great ways to control brown rot is if you are seeing any of these mummies on, the, uh, on your tree, make sure to get rid of them as soon as you can, or if they've already dropped to the ground try to get rid of those as well. Other uh, just general management for brown rot, again, sanitation is very important for this one and for all of our diseases. So remove all the rotted fruit and mummies that you find. Also, if you see a, if there's a canker on the twig, um, go ahead and remove those too. Cankers can just, uh, they will uh, decrease the overall, overall tree health. They're not able, um, those twigs or branches aren't able to get as many nutrients. That can make them much more susceptible to brown rot. Also, if there are any other wild uh, plum thickets that are adjacent to the orchard, that's gonna be a haven for, for the brown rot fungus in those wild, th wild plums. So if possible, try to remove any wild plums in the area. And, um, fungicide applications will, uh, will be a pretty good bet with um, a pretty good way to manage these, uh, th these fungi, this disease. So if you, have, if you have a history of this disease in your orchard, this is one that you probably would want to do a preventative spray for. Um, and you'd want to spray for it uh, really right at pink. Um, at pink, bloom, and then as the petals are falling. And so those three different, three different timings. And if you're continuing to have, um, to have disease, then you can even, uh, you may even want to apply a fungicide to the fruit, but you'd need to make sure that it's at least one month before, before you're harvesting or whatever the label says as far as the pre-harvest interval. So anytime you're using a, a fungicide or any sort of pesticide, the label is the law. And if the label says that you, you can't harvest this fruit for 90 days, then you better not spray it on the fruit if you're going to harvest within 90 days. So the next one, or just one of these general, general molds of fruit. Uh, this, is, this is gray mold caused by uh, botrytis. But this is the, you know, very common on all sorts of berries. I have a thing of strawberries that's been in my fridge for about, well, three or four days too long. And the bottom berries in that, in that case they're growing some of this gray fuzz. The, this is botrytis or gray mold. As far as management of gray mold, this is one that um, air circulation is very important. And so if you're able to choose a site that has good air circulation, not a whole lot of humidity um, and good sunlight, that will really decrease the amount of gray mold that we get. Tend to see it a lot in, um, a lot in the grocery store berries because there's not a whole lot of air movement moving through those packages. Within those packages, it's just nice and stagnant, a lot of humidity, and the botrytis is just able to take off. Um, canopy pruning can really increase air movement 
and that will greatly decrease the amount of grain mold in your, uh, um, on your plants. This is especially effective if you have raspberries. You want to avoid crowding the plants, so make sure that they are properly spaced, that they have good airflow in between. Also, um, you know, it's, mulch is always good. This is, Botrytis is one of those soil-borne fungi. So anytime, if you do any sort of overhead watering, those, the soil that has the fungus in it can splash up onto the leaves and infect the plant that way. So if you're able to put down a good mulch barrier between the, between the fruit and the soil, that's going to be a great way to cut down on grain mold. Also, same with, the, uh, with uh, brown rot. If you are starting to see some infected fruit, you'll want to make sure to remove that material as soon as you can. Otherwise, you're just really increasing the amount of inoculum that's available. And if you have, if you have a history of grain mold, basically there is, during the bloom period, you'll want to be doing a fungicide application just purely on a schedule. So really every seven to 10 days, especially if, it's as, um, if there are berries that you're hoping to sell or get some sort of um, economic um, benefit from. Next is bacterial wilt. This affects a lot of the cucurbits that we get. So your melons, tomatoes, things like that. And one of the nice things about bacterial wilt, so it really is just going to be, look like a sudden wilting of the, of the vine or of the plant. Just over the course of a couple of days, that entire plant may go from looking really good to looking not good at all. And what might happen if you go and cut that plant, right? At, um, take, that, take that stem and cut it, and try to slowly pull those two pieces of the stem apart, you may get something that looks like this bottom image that we have here. And that is the actual, those are um, strands of bacteria that have been flowing through the, through the vascular tissue of the, of the plant. But as we're pulling it apart, that bacteria is sticky, and so it's trying to stick together. But if you ever would see something like that, that's a sure sign that it is, that it is bacterial wilt. In, in, in addition to cucurbits, um, Tomatoes, peppers also can, uh, various, can, can get bacterial wilt. This disease is vectored by an insect, then, um, by, the, uh, by the flea beetle. And so insect management is fairly important for, for controlling this pathogen. And if you're able to control, the, to control the beetles, you should be able to greatly decrease the uh, bacterial wilt that you have. Problem with any of these diseases that include insect management is you need to be very cognizant of your off-target effects of the insecticides, if, you're, if that's your, um, how you choose to manage it. Pollinators are very important. Um, bees are already kind of struggling, would hate to, hate to harm the bees even more by going and spraying um, for these beetles. So if you are going to manage for bacterial wilt with um, insecticides, you'll want to try to apply those insecticides at a time when the bees aren't very active. And so also you'll want to use a, a selective insecticide if you can. Uh, yes, question. Both, as far as I know. Um, so one of the things about, about uh, bees being active, they tend to be more active early in the day and then also later in, the, um, later in the afternoon. So kind of those dusk and dawn periods, that's when the bees are most active. So also avoid spraying any insecticides during those times too. Should really help, um, help your overall pollinator health. Uh, you want to make sure to remove and discard any infected plants that are, that are in the garden. There are some varieties that are more, more or less resistant to bacterial wilt. So as with a lot of these other uh, diseases that I've talked about, choose the right plant for the right place. Also, um, we found that with bacterial wilt, reflective mulching works pretty well um, to, to decrease this. And so this would be a time where a plastic mulch would be more effective than, than a straw mulch or, or using wood chips. 
Next, um, tomato viruses. So tomatoes get all sorts of viruses. There's at least 10 to 12 tomato viruses that are considered common. And there's a lot more viruses that, tom the tomato, that um, can infect tomatoes. But some of the main ones that we see around here, tomato bushy stunt, uh, tomato mosaic, tomato spotted wilt, and also eggplant mosaic are some of the most common ones that, that we get. There's also a, a, a ring spot that we will see on occasion. And here is just what some of these, uh, here we have pictures of the, the fruit, the infected, the virus infected fruit, but then also what the, what the plants themselves look like. And the pictures are a little bit small, but the main takeaway from both of these pictures up at the top is if you look closely, it's just kind of abnormal, almost mangled growth of the leaves. They're not, they don't seem to be going in their normal, normal pattern. Some are cupped a lot more than they should be, or they're a lot smaller. Um, very typical of, of your virus diseases. As far as managing, um, viruses on tomatoes. Big thing is going to be controlling uh, controlling other weeds in the area. So we'd like generally we say to control weeds that are in that same that same uh, family as tomatoes. But there's a lot of viruses that can affect tomatoes. So really try to control all the weeds that are around your tomatoes, and that should cut down on the amount of uh, virus inoculum that's out there. Also, a great, a great thing is, um, is to separate your vegetable garden from your flower beds. And so uh, flowers can be a host for a lot of these viruses that infect tomatoes. And if, they're right, if the flowers are right next to, your, to the tomatoes, it's not going to be difficult for an insect or maybe, or you might accidentally um, transport, transmit the virus as well. Really separating the vegetable garden and your flower beds really work for this. And as soon as you would notice an infected plant, so if you're starting to see the top part of the plant um, has just abnormal growth, or you're getting some of these curled leaves, but it's only one or two of the um, one or one tomato, one or two tomatoes in the area, when the rest are fine, make sure and remove those infected plants as soon as you can. And if you're really concerned, I would even remove the, the adjacent plants as well. They, those may be infected with the, uh, with the virus, but just not showing symptoms yet. However, if like me, you're just growing the tomatoes for home consumption, it really doesn't matter a whole lot if, they, if the tomatoes have any of these viruses that I've talked about. They only cut down on, on the aesthetics appeal of the tomatoes, but taste for all of these should be just fine. Also, um, want to select, so early in the season then is your, if you've planted quite a few tomatoes and now you're going out to rogue the, uh, to rogue the weaker ones out, just make sure that you're selecting the most vigorous plants that you have. Um, if a plant is otherwise extremely healthy, it's probably going to be able to combat that virus a little bit better than, than a spindly or overall unhealthy plant. Also, controlling insects is a good idea for these. Um, again, insect, insect vectors are, caught, are, are the cause for a lot of these viruses. If you're able to control the insect vectors, you should be able to decrease the spread of the virus. But similar to bacterial wilt, you'll want to make sure that you're not um, hurting some of our very beneficial pollinators by controlling those insects. Next, we'll move on to just some tree diseases that are fairly common. First, I want to guess a lot of you guys have seen, but that's Diplodia tip blight. More recent name for it is Chiropsis tip blight, but Diplodia, people still know what you're talking about with that. Um, Diplodia tip blight tends to, uh, on the needles, will affect uh, this year's needles primarily, which we can see on the, on the picture there. And then also, when you look at the when you look at the cones that are formed, there may be a bunch of these small black pimple-looking things, just these black dots. And here we have a close-up of these. I like to call them pimples, 
Um, but they are pycnidia. And so those are fruiting bodies of the fungi, of the diplodia fungus that are erupting out of the bottom or out of those pine cones. And then each one of those little pimples will have dozens, if not hundreds, of spores inside of it. To control diplodia tip blight, um, this is one of those diseases, as with a lot of our fungi, fungal diseases, favored by rain and high humidity. And so if you're able to decrease humidity in any ways, such as pruning or making sure that things are properly spaced, that should really cut down on the amount of diplodia tip blight that you get. Um, also, if, you're, if you are seeing a lot of infected, um, infected cones on the ground, you may want to go ahead and clean those up too, since the spores will overwinter on the infected needles, but also on the infected cones. And while on it, in a single year, diplodia tip blight will not be a major harm to, uh, to any of your trees, if you continuously have this disease, eventually it's going to, to severely impact, impact your tree. As you can see from the picture that we have, this tree is not long for the world when this picture was taken and it's now gone. But after a few years of, of repeated infection, it will eventually kill the tree. So if you do have a history of diplodia tip blight, we would recommend doing, this is one of those when, when we would recommend doing a protective fungicide spray. And so this is a fungicide spray at two different, uh, two different times. First, you'll want to do um, about the third week of April. And so right as the, as the new needles are starting to emerge. And then you'll want to do that second application about the first week of May or when those needles are about 50% elongated. And so those two applications um, really do a good job of controlling diplodia tip blight. If you don't want to spray a... Um, if you don't want to spray a, uh, a fungicide, some of our copper products, such as Bordeaux's mixture, are, are very effective at controlling this one, too. Next, we'll look at some of our needle cast diseases. So again, uh, they affect a lot, of, a lot of different types of conifers. But these needle cast diseases, instead of, the, instead of affecting um, this year's growth, they tend to infect second and third year old, or two and three year old needles. And so as we can see on the pictures, uh, especially the picture um, on the bottom left and then also the one on the right, is that the, this year's growth is looking, looking pretty healthy. But it's when, it's, as we go back to two year old, three year old needles, that's when we start to see the injury occur. And if you would look at these, look at the needles underneath a, a magnifying glass or a microscope, similar to uh, diplodia, you would start to see a whole bunch of little black pimple looking things that are kind of erupting, erupting, out, of the, erupting out of the needles. And again, those are the fruiting bodies of the fungus. So, we have two main needle cast diseases that are, that are in Nebraska. The one that a lot of people are familiar with is Rhizosphera. Uh, Rhizosphera has been, been around for, for a long time. People know what, know, what it, know what it looks like. But about 10, 15 years ago, um, some, we started to see another needle cast appear, um, primarily in the, in the Great Lakes region, but it's since spread, spread throughout the country. And this is stigmina needle cast. And so it's a very similar looking disease, but they are two different fungi, two different fungi. And so you can kind of look, you can kind of tell them apart if you would look at, happen to look at them underneath the scope. Rhizosphera, those, um, those fruiting bodies tend to be pretty spherical, um, nice and round. They almost just look like a, like a basketball that's coming out of the, coming out of the needles. We also tend with rhizosphera, we also tend to see the needle or see those fruiting bodies are very much associated with the stomata. And so you will see them appear in, in lines on the bottom of the on the bottom of the needle where the where the um, needle stomata are. Compare that to stigmina, and as you can see on the picture here, for stigmina, those fruiting bodies aren't they're not near as spherical, not near as round. Underneath the microscope, they almost look like, 
like a dead, a dead dried spider that's flipped on its back. And so you'll just see a bunch of kind of hairs that are coming up out of it. Um, but that is what a stigmata tends to look like underneath the scope. Both of these in, infect um, second and third year old needles, but unlike, unlike Rhizosphera, stigmina doesn't appear as uniform on the needles as Rhizosphera does. And so stigmina is going to have, yeah, those kind of spider-like fruiting bodies, but they won't be near as uniform as you would see with Rhizosphera. Luckily, management of these two diseases, and I apologize for these slides, there's a lot of words on them, but mainly it's just for your, um, to take home. But management of both these needle casts is pretty much the same. Uh, as far as cultural practices that you can do, if you're able to, uh, to clean up the fallen needles, that's a great, a great way to decrease the amount of inoculum that you have. Also, um, put some mulch around the base of the tree. Try to make sure there's not a lot of grass that's growing right up next to the base of the tree. If you have grass that's growing up to the base of the tree, that can really increase your humidity levels there as well, which can increase the amount of, increase the amount of needle caps. But for, for both of these, we recommend um, two applications per year. One of the problems is with stigmina, this one, if you have it, it may require indefinite applications of, of fungicides. So for the next, at least for three years, you would need to do a fungicide spray. But research is ongoing if that fungicide spray is needed for five, ten years down the road if, to save that spruce. Rhizosphera, on the other hand, typically if you do two years of, of a fungicide spray for Rhizosphera, that will uh, knock it down to a point when your tree will no longer be negatively impacted by the, by the disease. Next is a very common one that we've seen is pine wilt disease. It uh, primarily affects scotch pines, but now that a lot of the scotch pines are gone, they're starting to move into some of these other pines that we have. Um, can affect white Austrian, Austrian pines. We have seen it on ponderosa pine as well. Typically, pine wilt disease infects older trees that are, have some other stresses going on. We really don't see it on young trees all that often. So about 10 years old is the youngest trees that we tend to see pine wilt. But we will get this very rapid decline over the course of just a couple of months with this disease. The picture that we have right here, um, in the spring, that tree, was, that tree was completely green. By fall, it was dead. So just over the course of a couple of months, the tree was completely wiped out. And the causal, uh, causal organism for this disease is the pine wilt nematode, uh, Bursophilanchus xylophilus. But that nematode is actually vectored by a beetle. And so the pine sawyer beetle spreads those nematodes from one tree to the next. And now we're getting into a little bit of the pine wilt uh, disease cycle. It's a pretty complicated disease cycle includes four different organisms, and so it's a great one um, that I like to talk about. But so here we have a, a fairly healthy pine tree, and then we have a, a pine sawyer beetle that lands on that healthy pine tree. Inside of that pine soil needle, or inside of that pine soil beetle, we're going to have, it's going to have some of the nematodes inside of it. As the beetle feeds on the, um, feeds on the tree, those nematodes will then escape the beetle and start to um, get into the tree themselves. If you have a resistant host, those nematodes will then die as soon as they get into the tree. However, it's a, if it's a susceptible host, scotch pine, Austrian pine, something like that, well, now those beetles can, or now those nematodes can start to reproduce and increase in numbers throughout the tree, inside of the tree. And what you might be able to see if you peel back the bark is some of these nice kind of, um, kind of curved uh, galleries underneath the bark caused by the beetle. The other thing that you will see is that when you cut the tree, 
there might be some kind of blue stain. Um, looks like the part of the part of the branch has been has just been stained blue, and that's the blue stain fungus. And the nematodes are actual the nematodes are fungal feeders. And so as the nematodes reproduce and reproduce in increased numbers throughout the tree, they are moving this blue stained fungus throughout the tree as well, so that they have something to feed on. And as the tree um, continues to, to decline, as the amount of fungus inside of the branches and nematodes both increase, the tree is declining and now is sending out a whole bunch of stress pheromones, which means that the bark beetles, or the, uh, sorry, the uh, Sawyer beetles are now attracted to the, uh, they're now attracted to these diseased trees. They're going to come and, and they may come and feed on it. The other way that they can, the other thing that they can do is that the pupa that the beetles have laid in the tree, um, that they can, um, they can eat some, or they can absorb some of the nematodes as well. But then now we have a, an emerged uh, beetle that has a gut full of nematodes and it's out searching for another healthy tree. Again, pretty complicated life cycle. It's one of my favorites to talk about. So. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me. But as far as management and identification of this disease goes, um, chemical controls have had kind of mixed results. They tend to be fairly, uh, fairly expensive and require repeat applications as well. So removal of the tree, removal of diseased trees is one of the one of the best options. But you want to try to remove these diseased trees by the end of April. Um, the bark or the, the beetles emerge um, kind of in, as we get into May and into the, some of the summer months. And so we want to try to get rid of that tree before the beetles have actually emerged. And then that tree should be, uh, the, the wood should be burned or buried. You don't want to chip it. If you chip it, the nematodes can survive and they can go on to infect something else. As far as sampling a tree for pine wilt nematode, you want to make sure that you get a large enough sample that we can actually test something. Get quite a few samples into the clinic for pine wilt nematode on branches that are about, oh, half an inch in diameter. So some of the smaller branches that have may, have, may have already fallen to the ground. We're not going to find any nematodes in that sample. So really, we ask that you sample wood, um, either take a core from from the main trunk, or try to um, collect a branch that's at least one and a half to two inches in diameter and about six inches long, and that should be a big enough sample that we can find the nematode if need be. Next one is fire blight. Affects apples, crab apples, pear, cantoniaster, hawthorns, and quite a few others. Um, this is caused by a bacterial disease, and so it's er, an, another one of those Erwinia pathogens. And this, um, this bacteria, so it causes these very, very distinct kind of shepherd's crook and black, um, black ends, of, uh, ends of the shoots, but the bacteria overwinters at the edge of cankers. And so here we have, a, in this corner picture, we have a canker that is caused by fire blight. And you see, if you're able to notice some of the kind of the shiny exudate on that canker, that's the fire blight bacteria. That, that's the Orwinia bacteria that's now oozing out of it. And so any insects that are, that are, that are there, rain or wind, that can all spread the, uh, spread the bacteria to different shoots or also to different trees in the area. As far as controlling fire blight, you want planting resistant varieties is going to be your best bet. Prune and discard your infected tissue, um, infected branches. You'll also want to make sure that you're not pruning during the middle of the season. And so we recommend that you do your pruning when the trees are dormant. But also if you're cutting out that canker, don't cut out, don't prune right beneath that canker. Make sure that you're pruning down at least 6 to 12 inches underneath that canker because that bacteria will have spread throughout the tree. And even though the canker is no longer there, there may be some bacteria there if you only, if you just prune that out right underneath that canker. 
Here we have um, apple scab, favored by wet and humid weather. We tend to get these olive and greenish black lesions on the leaves, petioles, and also on the fruit. Um, control of apple scab, again, same with the other ones that I've talked about, plant resistant varieties. You want to make sure to rake and remove um, infected leaves. And for this is one of those that by the time we start to see symptoms of apple scab, it's often too late. And so if you have a history of, of apple scab in your area, you'll want to start doing some protective fungicide sprays as, the, um, as, as soon as flowering starts. This one, uh, cedar apple rust, great, uh, great, great symptoms, or actually signs of the, signs of the disease. So uh, cedar apple rust has uh, two different hosts that it has to, um, that it requires to survive. This is, um, this is the disease on a cedar tree. And this is one of, these are epithelial horns that are coming out. So those orange fingers that are protruding out of that gall, those are chock full of the fungal spores. Kind of looks like, um, looks alienish almost. But can affect apple, crab apple, and hawthorns, um, favored by wet weather. And then the spores are blown from the juniper host onto nearby apple trees. And then the apple trees um, get infected. The leaves can be, become infected. But when the fruit's infected, it's infected at the, um, at the blossom end. And then that fruit tends to get distorted, and really it's just not going to be near as big as you would get otherwise. Here is the, again, quickly the life cycle of cedar apple rust. And so it overwinters as these galls on the junipers or on the cedar trees. In the spring, those teleal horns start to come out. And when you're seeing those teleal horns start to come out on the junipers, that's going to be a sign that now I want to spray a fungus. If you do want to do a fungicidal spray for your apples, now is the time to do it. As the, as the spores will blow from the, the junipers or cedars onto your apple trees. Next one, uh, Dutch elm disease. This is a fungal disease that's vectored by the um, elm bark beetles. Can also, but it can also spread through infected grafts um, and root grafts. And so if you have a, a Dutch elm, um, a tree with Dutch elm disease and a few other elms nearby, you really want to be um, careful to make sure that, um, that you're doing some trenches to make sure that the, graft, that the roots aren't grafting together. If the roots graft together, that fungus can spread throughout. Um, and again, management for this one is primarily removal of the, removal of the tree. Once, it's, once you start to see symptoms on the tree, it's typically too late to do anything to save it. There are some elm trees where people have done, um, done some fungicidal in injections that have prolonged the life of that tree. But again, that's very expensive and re uh, requires repeat applications pretty much every year. And the streaked vascular tissue that we have in the corner picture here if you peel back the bark and you see uh, just these nice, very evident streaks like that, that's one of the diagnostic signs of Dutch elm disease, symptoms of Dutch elm disease. Next is oak wilt, and this is another one of those fungal vascular diseases of trees. Um, similar, to, similar to Dutch elm, will just cause It'll start out kind of as individual branches that are starting to yellow or die. Eventually, it'll be the entire oak tree. Um, but again, with these, once you, if you get oak wilt and you're starting to see um, these leaves that kind of get this burned, kind of these burned leaves often, uh, just half of the leaf will have that burned look to it. It's a good sign of, of, of oak wilt, but once, it, once your oak trees have it, there's a good chance they have to be removed. Um, again, fungicide and uh, chemical, fungus, chemical injections, very expensive and can open the tree up to some other diseases as well. Verticillium, another one of these vascular wilts. Verticillium, in addition to a lot of trees, verticillium affects pretty much 
every plant that's out there, especially if the plant will have a woody base, there is a verticillium dahlia can probably infect it. Um, it's caused by a soil-borne fungus that, applies, that attacks the vascular system. And similar to Dutch elm disease with verticillium, if you peel that bark back, you'll just tend to see some nice, um, some nice streaks that occur, as we can see right here. Um, this one you want to favor, it's favored by cool temperatures. There are some, uh, some trees have a better rating for verticillium than others. And so if it, you know it's in the area, make sure you're choosing a resistant variety. Um, verticillium uh, pruning is somewhat effective for this, especially if you catch it early enough. But if you are doing pruning to remove the diseased tissue, you'll want to make sure that you're disinfecting your, um, your tools between, between cuts so that you're not spreading the, spreading the fungus. Also, if you do have the infected wood, you'll want to make sure to burn it. That's the only way to, to kill this fungus. And its uh, verticillium wilt is much worse when there are other environmental stresses going on. Next one is just a general canker of a tree. And so cankers are a localized um, diseased area or lesion of the bark that often result in an open wound. And you can, have, you can have cankers on the main trunks, you can have them on the primary branches, you can have cankers on the smallest twigs that are, that are out there. Uh, here's an example of, this is Cytospora canker on a spruce tree. But, you know, if anytime you have a tree um, and it's one portion of it is just dead, try to follow that dead portion back to, just follow it down back to the main trunk if you can. And there's a good chance you'll see some sort of canker that's developed. That canker cuts off the, um, cuts off the vascular system, nutrients and uh, Nutrients and water are no longer able to flow through there to get to the to get to the affected areas of the tree. So some conditions that favor cankers um, you know, and other environmental stresses that may occur. So if you have drought stress, something like that, that that a drought stress increases the prevalence of some cankers, but other cankers are favored by excess moisture. So it's a little bit difficult. Um, a lot of cankers, they don't require, but they really prefer having some sort of wound that they're able to enter through. So, able, um, so um, avoiding ex excess wounding of the plant of your trees can really um, decrease the amount of cankers sometimes. But also, if you get moisture within one week, within one week of that wounding event, that's a very favorable environment um, for infection of not only a canker, but really any of these other fungal diseases that I've talked about. So when pruning, try to prune at a time. If, if you look at the long-term forecast and it says there's no rain for a couple of weeks, that's gonna be a good time to prune. As far as management of cankers, identification is typically not necessary, aside from just knowing, do I have a canker or don't I have a canker? The actual um, fungal pathogen, fungal or bacterial pathogen causing that, typically not going to matter because 90% of the time we'll just tell you to prune out the affected area and hope that the plant comes back. Chemical controls typically not effective for cankers as they would require um, repeat, and, uh, repeat applications. We also don't recommend doing any sort of wound dressing um, to help, uh, help with canker management. When you address the wound, that can just increase the humidity um, in the tree, make it uh, really favors the, um, the fungi or bacteria that may cause the canker. And again, uh, you want to prune during the dormant period when the tree is um, when dormant period when it's going to be dry. And as with the as with fire blight, you want to make sure that when you're pruning that, that you're cutting um, at least six inches or so underneath that canker. A foot's going to be even better, but just make sure you're going down far enough in the tree that you're able to cut out that entire diseased area. Real quickly, a few turf diseases that you guys may run into. Uh, brown patch, very common, um, caused by Rhizoctonia solani, but very typical symptoms of 
this, as the name suggests, are just these um, circular brown patches that we get. Often, there will be a, um, a, darker, a darker margin on for brown patch. Uh, management of brown patch really goes into um, fertilizer management. And so if, you over, if you're over fertilizing your lawn, it's going to grow much more quickly. It's going to have very lush growth, and that's much more susceptible to infection by the, um, by the brown patch fungus. And if you are seeing, um, if you do have a lot of this out there, we do recommend fungicide, um, fungicidal sprays. Another turf disease that you guys may run into is dollar spot. Um, again, very common, very common turf disease. Affects all of the, uh, all of the, um, all the, all the cool season turfs that we have. The lesions for dollar spot tend to look almost um, hourglass shaped. And so they will be, a, it'll be a larger lesion that spans the length of the blade, but then often in the middle of that lesion, it'll be kind of pinched to give it an hourglass. Um, hourglass look. And this is another one that if you are seeing it in your lawn, fungicide sprays are very effective in controlling it. And here we just have a, have a, uh, a diagram out of the University of Purdue. Mentions a lot of different, uh, different uh, pathogens of turf as well as when they're effective. And so typically if we know when these, um, when these different diseases are affecting turf, we're able to really um, pin it down to maybe two or three diseases that it might even be. And so if we would look at, the, if we are seeing heart, um, a lot of disease in July, there's not a whole lot of them that, where they have that thick bar that goes all the way across the month of July there. So before we end and I send you on your way, just wanna bring you back to the, to the disease triangle. And remember that we have these three different portions of the disease pathosystem, your host, pathogen, and the environment. And the way we manage any sort of disease is how well, how well can we manipulate any part of that pathosystem. And typically, we tend to think that we're able to influence the host the most. Um, this is especially true for any sort of agronomic setting. If you're planting a resistant variety, that is, that is um, manipulating the host for what you want. Pathogens, the only way that we're really able to manipulate or influence those are through sanitation or a, a fungicide spray. And typically, we tend to say environment, we have the least amount of control over because we can't control the rain. We can't control if it's going to hail, can't control if we're going to get 80 mile an hour winds running through. But in the landscape, we actually can manipulate that microclimate or that uh, localized environment a fair amount. So the ways that you can manipulate the environment within a landscape, first is just make sure that you're spacing things properly. Um, ad allow adequate space to, um, to increase airflow throughout. Also, avoid localized monocultures. Try not to have the exact same variety of plants all in the same area. If you do, if one thing comes in and takes one of them out, it can take all of them out. So really, if possible, if possible have some diversity in your, um, in your landscape. Molting um, and some other practices uh, that can influence water runoff and also water retention. Also, any sort of pre-plant soil amendments can really um, influence, the, influence the environment. So if you're adding some mulch as you're before you're planting, that's adding, um, that's influencing the environment. But general rules for plant health management, again, choose the right plant for the right place. So that, you know, know where your environment is, know how much space you have, and also know what else is in your landscape so you have some diversity. Be observant. Are you just looking at looking at the plants, or are you actually seeing the issues that are occurring? If you're actually seeing what's going on, you have, there's a good chance that you'll catch the, uh, catch the problems early when there's still, um, still time to do something about them. Also, minimize any other sort of abiotic stresses that may be occurring, and that will increase overall health of the tree, 
and then sanitize, um, sanitization to make sure that you're removing those infected tissue. But now when removing, or how do you dispose of that infected tissue then? So we had a question about compost pretty early on. Technically, yeah, proper composting will kill most plant pathogens. And so if your compost pile gets to 140 or 140, 160 degrees Fahrenheit at multiple points throughout the season, and all point and you're continuously turning it so all points of the compost pile have reached that temperature they should that should kill the plant pathogens but like i said i am yet to see a home compost pile that's done 100% correctly so typically with if you have high levels of disease i would not recommend on throwing them in your compost pile there's a good chance some of them will survive. Um, and if you plan to use that compost, you're now spreading that inoculum. However, if you just have a few minor leaf spots, those are probably going to be okay to, to throw in the compost pile. If you have tomatoes that have three or four leaf spots um, on, on the, top, uh, the top leaves, go ahead and compost those and you shouldn't run into issues. But if you have higher levels of disease, then you really want to avoid composting. In that case, burying tissue is very effective for a lot of these foliar diseases that we, uh, that we deal with. Um, and so it, can de it destroys the leaves, but also now the pathogen is, is no longer has that food source or the leaf to feed on, and it will die. Burying diseases, um, disease tissue doesn't really work if you're dealing with a crown or root rot. Those are already in the soil, um, so you're now just moving that to another area. Same if you have a nematode issue, um, or those will, those are not affected by, by burying. But if you are burying diseased tissue, try to bury at least a foot down. That will greatly decrease the amount of wildlife that may accidentally, um, accidentally unbury it and bring it up to the surface. Or as you're just out doing work in your yard, that there's a good chance if it's at least a foot deep, you won't unearth it. Other thing to do is bury, um, bury that disease tissue away from other similar plants. So if you have, have a bunch of tomatoes that have late blight, don't go ahead and don't bury the late blight infected tomatoes right next to your tomato patch. Try to um, go to a different area of the lawn where there's nothing, no similar plants, and then you can bury the disease tissue there. And just some general tips for uh, disease management. And, uh, this is especially true for low levels of disease. So you're just seeing a few of these, a few of these spots, nothing, nothing terribly severe. You don't want to do a whole lot of work, but you want to try to try to increase, try to make it so next year things will look better. So if you have any trees or shrubs, when the when the leaves drop, just mow over them. That'll shred the leaves. It'll greatly increase the, uh, increase the time it takes, or greatly decrease the time it takes for those leaves to decompose. The, uh, a lot of those uh, foliar pathogens can't survive on decomposed leaves. And you're, if you have a perennial, uh, perennial garden bed with low levels of disease, just go ahead and prune or cut those back to the soil line, remove, um, destroy all of the disease tissue, and then hope that next year when, they, when the plants come up, they'll come up in, in better shape. For your garden, crop ro or plant rotation is going to be one of your best bets for, for low to moderate levels of disease. And also, anything that you can do that overall increases airflow and decreases the leaf wetness period will greatly decrease the amount of disease that you have. With that, done with my spiel, and we'll take any, any other questions. Okay. Um, nightshade, uh, any of the solanacea, uh, do you know, um, yeah, I am not, unfortunately, I'm not a, not good at plant ID. I'm better at looking at things under a microscope. Um, so the, uh, but yeah, the, the solanacea, um, they're in that same family. I, I do know that nightshade's one of them. But. Yeah. 
So any other? Yes. Okay, so we have a question about cedar apple rust. And you said they're on cedar trees? Yes. Now, and the, the, the orange, um, the first one is the little, the purple five, paper-lettered Yeah. The, where the, the, or the, the orange, the fingers, orange gel things are coming out, yeah. Yeah, so a, a, a gall, yeah. And then there's the orange fungi. Mm -hmm. that yes. Well, um, honey locust as well, crab apple. So there are a few others. A lot of the galls, yeah. Yeah, so in the spring, it should be, should be beautiful. Um, so you'll see a bunch of these. Unfortunately, as a uh, you know pathologist, no. Um, it's if if you have enough infection, um, it can it can decrease the overall health of the cedars to a point where something else can easily take them out. But the other thing is these spores they can move a long way in the in, via the wind. So the, um, there is evidence of these spores moving over a mile in the wind. So if you have a crab apple tree within a mile, there's, there's a good chance that may, that's where it's coming from. Are all junipers host to cedar apple rust? I'm not sure. I think so. Um, but I am not sure. And I would have to, I'd have to get back to them um, to look, to see that. But as Yeah, I think it's likely, but I am not, I'm not sure. The next question is, do you know um, is there a way to control the nematodes? So question about is, are there ways to control nematodes? Um, there are some, there are some, uh, there are some chemical drenches that can be done. Don't recommend them very often because they, um, tend to be very generalized, um, generalized pesticides. They'll have a lot of off-target effects. The main thing that we recommend if you have an issue with nematodes um, is just to, to plant somewhere else. Um, nematodes are gonna be in that soil, so just try to move your, if you can, move your garden bed, um, do that. Does apple scab attract wasps? I am not sure about that. I would have to, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, so yeah, the Terry had just mentioned that the, the open wounds, you now have more sugars that are available, and so that may, that may cause the wasps to, to flock to the affected trees. Uh, it depends how bad, um, depends how bad the powdery mildew was last year. If it was, if it was to the point that you were starting to see some, starting to see some of the leaves die, then I would recommend doing a, I'd recommend doing a, a fungicide spray as soon as they come up. Otherwise, if it was kind of mo a low to moderate levels of powdery mildew, I would recommend waiting and, and then see if, if the powdery mildew starts to develop then you may want to look into a look into a spray. Oh, um, I skipped. Uh, so, what do I recommend for sanitizing pruning equipment? Typically, a ten percent a ten percent bleach solution works quite well. There are also some commercial products that you can buy. Uh, I know Green Shield is one of them, but yeah, ten percent bleach, seventy percent alcohol or some of these commercial products work very well to sanitize equipment. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you are, if you are dipping your, your sanitization or your pruning tools, 
in, a, in your 10% bleach solution. You'll want to make sure to oil them because you're now adding more moisture and a lot of these pruning tools can rust. You want to avoid that. And so it helps to oil as well. Do marigolds attract nematodes away from other host plants? Um, I don't think so. And so I do not, I mean, you know, marigolds, people uh, plant marigolds around their garden to, to keep a lot of the, um, to keep a lot of the, um, a lot of the insects out of there. Have not seen that same sort of thing with marigolds. However, there is a little bit of evidence that, um, that marigold roots do produce some, compo some compounds that are anti-nematicidal, but the nematodes won't move through your landscape just to get to the marigolds. All right, and we have one more here. Uh, so a question was if you have if you hire an arborist to take out a take out a tree uh, a tree that has pine wilt disease Is it their responsibility to bear um, to make sure that it's disposed of correctly? I am not sure but I would I doubt it. Um, I would bet that unless you unless you specifically talk to the arborist um, and let them know that this needs to be done I, I, it would not surprise me if they would just chip it. We've seen, we've seen a lot of, um, we've seen a lot of pine wilt that's uh, seen, seen pine wilt be spread just through uh, wood chips a lot. All right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> oh, thank you. Take <laughs> care. Oh, thanks for coming. <laughs>